This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Welcome to the next in the series of Wrigley lectures that we've been having this year. Uh, I'm John Hi. Fink, the director of the Global Institute of Sustainability. And it's my pleasure today to introduce <coughs> Susan Anderson from the city of Portland. And uh, those of us who have been in Phoenix for a long time have an uh, interesting relationship with Portland. It's always set up as the anti-Phoenix or <laughs> vice versa. Uh, and there's a lot of lessons, I think, that we've all felt that we could learn from Portland. Part of the question is how much of what goes on there is translatable <coughs> to other settings that don't have whatever the special characteristics of Portland are. And Susan is uh, probably the ideal person to talk with us about that. Uh, her title is Director of the Office of Sustainable Development in Portland. And probably you were one of the first people in the country to have a title like that in the city, <laughs> I would imagine. Um, in Portland, as many of you know, uh, in the early 90s was one of the <coughs> first places to uh, say that they were going to try to get a handle on the, the carbon footprint and, and uh, uh, carbon CO2 emissions from the city, and so they adopted their own plan for dealing with global climate change, global warming, and then as, as the rest of the world has kind of caught up with that thinking, they've tried to stay up with it and stay ahead of it. And um, uh, so Susan has had other, other jobs in that area, working with the Department of Energy before her current position uh, in, in Oregon, and uh, has been uh, a consultant involved with land use planning. She has degrees from UC Santa Barbara and University of Oregon. And today she's going to talk to us about building sustainable communities. Susan. Great, thank you. <laughs> so good afternoon. Wake up, everybody. Awake? Okay. Late in the day, you know. You don't know how it goes. So, um, I was invited here by Thad, who is, maybe some of you know him, I don't know how all of you are in the same classes together, and he guaranteed that it would be, a, you know, it was in June, he said, yeah, come in November, because then you'll get a little bit of sun, because, <laughs> so one of the things that is obviously the same between Portland and Phoenix is the weather, because today it's now been proven that, indeed, it's almost the same as it is at home right now. Um, so I was thinking about this class, and I was thinking um, a few days ago, I actually did the same kind of thing in Santa Barbara, and um, was going back to when I was in school, and um, I got degrees in environmental science, and another degree in economics, and another degree, degree in planning. And so, of this group here, how many of you are, would you say, are related to sort of the environmental science sort of area? So not very many. Um, how about economics and policy? in business, engineering. I'm trying to figure out who you all are. Well, you're all different. And what's left? Planning. Planning, all right. <coughs> what is planning? Any? Oh, all right. Well, the anti-environmental, anti maybe it is. Um, well, when I, when I went to school back then, um, I was in an environmental studies program originally. And my parents were like, what is that? That's not a real thing. And so I said, okay, okay, I'll get another major at the same time. So I got a second major in business and economics. And they thought that was really good. And so I'd go to the environmental classes. And in those classes, you would learn that science is the baseline for all decision making and that you know, the natural science and ecology should be used as the base for all you know, all, all the important things that, that happen in the world. And then I would, two hours later, go to an economics class where the whole idea of <clears throat> that people are rational beings and they will make rational decisions and that, you know, economics is the basis for all decision making. And then I got out of school and, and went into the real world and learned that politics is actually the only thing that actually makes any difference. And so I encourage you as you go through the studies that you're doing, and that's, I'm kind of saying that in jest, but I'm really, really meaning it. And so in terms of as you work, whether it's in the private sector or the public sector in the future, 
that the facts do matter. The economics and business facts matter. And the natural science, you know, is global warming real? Is there really air pollution? Is there really water quality issues or water conservation issues? And those things are very real. But you'll often find that the politicians won't listen and that it's really, really important to translate the knowledge that you're all getting here in a way that they will listen to you and market it in a way that makes it important. And so that's kind of the lesson I've learned after getting out of school and working for all these years is that it's not often what you know, it's how you've marketed it and how you've presented it. And a lot of that I learned because I got out of school, like after graduate school, so I got, went and got another degree. And then my first job, of course, was waitressing and then all the other things you do when you get out of school and can't find a job. And so for a year I worked for a marketing firm and because that was what I could do. I could write well. And so I wrote short, learned how to write seven word sentences. You know, I learned how to take complex information and put it into a way that people understand. And so that's the other part is a lot of times um, we get out of school and I really just think it's important that people have an understanding for how to communicate all this really important knowledge that you're all gaining. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, sustainability from a local government perspective and talk about what's going on in Portland related to this kind of broad idea of sustainability and more particularly to the issue of global warming and global climate change. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, First of all, let me tell you a little bit um, about my office. It's called the Office of Sustainable Development. It's not called the Office of Sustainability because that sort of makes people think it's like a hippie sort of sustainability thing that no one really knows what that means. And the whole idea of adding development to it gave it sort of some strength and purpose and, and connected it to like economic development and things that people took seriously. And literally seven years ago, one, you couldn't say the word sustainability because no one knew what it meant and it's a really long word with a lot of syllables and people would, everybody in this room would define it differently. Um, and so <clears throat> what we did was we took some key programs in the city related to energy efficiency, uh, green building and sustainable construction practices, all of the solid waste and recycling programs and several other um, environmental programs and uh, regulatory things related to electric utilities and natural gas utilities. Um, and we put those things in one place along with some other environmental programs. Um, in recent years, we've sort of added on this whole idea of sustainable economic development and looking at how all of this work we've done over the past, literally since the late 70s in the Portland area, has ended up creating a lot of jobs. And so there's a whole industry related to a lot of my friends who used to work in firms with, you know, 30 architects, now have 120 doing green building and sustainable architecture all over the world. And it's kind of because they started doing it in Portland to meet some local, um, either voluntary or regula regulatory kind of uh, things they had to do to be in Portland. And they have now, you know, this environmental movement kind of transformed into an economic development program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the local level and local government can really make a difference on the issue of climate change um, in particular. So this building there in the middle is um, where our office is at. We're in with a bunch of other environmental organizations predominantly mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, it's a LEED gold building that's about 120 years old. Um, so how many of you been, have been to Oregon or to Portland? Probably like most of you, but no. for those of you who haven't, I'm, I have to do this when I go out of town. It's the Chamber of Commerce makes me do this. So <laughs> we, um, I'm going to give you a little tour. So that's the Columbia River. It's gorgeous. We have great rivers, rivers all over the place. A little different. That is a little different than, than Phoenix. Um, the uh, Crater Lake, so we have a lot of rivers, a lot of lakes. The Pacific. Yeah. <laughs> I said Oregon. <laughs> okay, how many here are actually from Portland or have lived in Portland? Okay, oh, uh oh. So I can't make stuff up because you guys will keep me on. Um, so this is the Pacific Ocean, again, not in Portland, but an hour from Portland to the west. Uh, Mount Hood and the Cascades are an hour to the east um, with great opportunities for skiing and snowboarding, um, great rafting, my personal favorite. 
um, uh, incredible fish and nature and salmon um, throughout that actually could be in Portland. There are salmon in the river. Um, <coughs> these are vineyards right outside the urban growth boundary, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And so there's these incredible different uh, natural resources in the community and just outside. Um, we like to play in Portland. We like to party. Um, we like to eat. Um, and we like to walk and stroll. And these are our, um, some of our farmers' markets in town. So the city is a really vibrant city right downtown. But right behind us, always in the background, is sort of, <coughs> excuse me, are these huge trees and forests and Mount Hood kind of looming in the distance. And sort of this gentle or not so gentle reminder that this is a gorgeous place filled with incredible natural resources. And because of that, um, people in Oregon have cared about the environment for a really long time. So going back to the 60s and 70s, there have been a lot of statewide laws and local plans and policies to protect the environment. So back in the mid-70s, um, a law was passed that required statewide land use planning. And it required each community, even communities with 1,000 people, to do sort of a comprehensive plan that met 19 different statewide goals related to um, housing and agriculture and forestry and economic development. And you went through all of those. And because it was the 70s, and Jimmy Carter had us all putting on sweaters um, and such, energy was one of those goals. So <clears throat> at that time, back in 1979, Portland actually adopted its first local energy policy, which no one really understood what it was or why they were doing it. But there was this idea that cities actually have a huge impact on energy use. And that there's the federal government that's going to set big cafe standards, fuel efficiency standards for cars and such. The states are going to do some things, but that cities, they're the ones that do building codes and streets and transportation and land use and housing and they own a lot of buildings and that actually cities have a huge impact <coughs> on the way energy is used in our communities and that urban areas have a huge impact basically on the energy of use of the whole country. So we thought it was really important, not we, not me, but way back then in the 70s to begin to get this idea that energy and housing and land use and transportation and economic development are really um, interconnected. <clears throat> um, at the same time, as part of that land use planning, each community had to set up an urban growth boundary. And so the urban growth boundary is more or less just a ring around the city. And in Portland, instead of it just being Portland, it's the Portland plus the 23 other cities that are in the metropolitan area and the three counties. And so the ring basically defines where development can and cannot occur. And it was done way back in the 70s, not thinking at all about energy use in general or any of these other issues or transportation. It was to protect forests and farmlands. So these incredible, incredible, you know, natural resources were, that were there and that were basically the, the basis of our economy also um, in the Northwest. What we didn't know, you know, who knew that the urban growth boundary would actually be our greatest energy conservation measure that we had ever could have taken? Because what it did was it caused growth to be contained, which made it more dense, which made it so that you could actually live in a place where you can walk to the bus easily. And it basically built from there um, a lot of that. Along with that, in the 80s, what everybody calls smart growth planning, literally back in the 80s and early 90s, um, a lot of the planning started to happen that was what we all call transit-oriented development. And so um, there were rules that said if you do development along any uh, transit corridors, bus lines, major light rail, or anything else, and now it's even, it seems like it's even along bikeways, you basically have to do multifamily or mixed-use development along those corridors. And what that does is it makes it so you don't waste the land near the transit with single-family homes, you actually do it in a place so that people um, who are along the corridors are able then to use the transit. So there's lots of other things we had way back then, a bottle bill, you know, to recycle. We cleaned up the be beaches and the rivers, and um, we started actually doing recycling way back in, I think it became curbside recycling was like 1982 or something, and started doing it um, a long time ago. 
So um, we were talking just a few minutes ago about how some difference between Portland and, and uh, Phoenix. And one of the things is that one of the reasons we are where we are today is because we started a really long time ago. We kind of cheated. And so when I go out and do this talk with a lot of places, it's like, well, we started so long ago. That's kind of why we've gotten a lot done in the interim. So let me kind of um, to tell the story. Let me go back in time um, to 1993 when I was just kind of out of graduate school and with my floppy disk here, went to city council and said, and convinced one of the council members that global warming was indeed real. And shouldn't we do a plan as a local government to uh, show what cities can do to reduce carbon dioxide? So we joined with 12 other cities um, with some grant funding. And the cities were primarily in Europe and then a couple other North American cities, um, Dade County, believe it or not, which is Miami, um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Portland, and Toronto were the North American cities. And then the rest were, were in Europe. Um, if you look at our plans, they're almost all identical. We didn't really know what we were doing, so we all stole from each other and made up the plans. But what we did was figure out a methodology for how to count up the carbon emissions way back then um, in the early 90s. And so since then, we've been tracking emissions for a really, really um, long time. So we did the plan back in 93 because when we looked around, we didn't see anything happening at the federal government level. And we saw all these opportunities, and you know, exactly 14 years later, whatever it is, we still don't see a lot happening at the federal level, but we do see a lot happening at cities. So since we adopted this plan in 93, there's been about 100 other cities in the US who are either in the midst of doing it or they have already adopted their own uh, local plans. And there's really about 400 cities um, worldwide who have done similar things. And we've all kind of borrowed from each other lots of great ideas because a lot of this stuff isn't technical. It's not figuring out you know, which kind of solar equipment to use. It's figuring out how do you market this kinds of stuff. How do you do behavior change without being command and control? How do you basically change the way um, what people buy and the way that they work in their business or at home? So we identified um, a series of objectives in energy efficiency, renewable energy, transportation, waste reduction and recycling, and then trees and sequestration in terms of looking at carbon dioxide emissions. Um, eight years later, we got a better cover. And we also updated the plan. And in this plan, it's the same categories, basically, with also a big emphasis on public education and community and outreach. Um, the goal was set at a 10% reduction below 1990 levels by 2010, somewhat similar to the whole Kyoto thing. And we said, you know, if that's not going to happen in the US, at least perhaps Portland can adopt a similar plan. Um, so what's happened? Well, since 1990, carbon dioxide emissions in Portland have actually decreased by 14% per person. And at the same time, um, our population has increased by about 14 or 15%. So we're back to 1990 levels. The rest of the US is up about 16% on average. And actually, the rest of most of Oregon is up almost that much. So what's, what's happened is something's happening different in Portland than really most of the rest of the country. And a couple of things I think that are interesting about that is that this was happening at a time. You'll, you'll hear a lot of people say, oh, you can't work on the issue of global warming because it'll ruin the economy. This was absolutely during the time where Oregon's had its strongest economy ever. And it was a time where you know, growth was happening and jobs were being created, and more and more people wanted to move to Portland. And so before I, I'm going to go through some of the different kinds of things that are going on in the city, um, the main two messages I'd say that there are out of this is that, um, first of all, none of this happened because of global warming. None of these improvements, the reductions in CO2 emissions, didn't happen because anyone cared about the issue of global warming. It happened because people wanted a more livable, walkable place to live in. They wanted to cut their costs for business. They wanted to reduce um, energy use in their home because they wanted to cut their bills or they wanted it to be more light-filled or more comfortable. Um, they cared about affordable housing for renters. They wanted to reduce traffic congestion. So there are a hundred other reasons to take the exact same action you would take to reduce carbon dioxide emissions or methane emissions, but you would do it for some other reason. 
And then the second thing is, so that the important part of that is you can have a conversation about this with business, with residents, with your grandmother, with your kids, with whoever, and you don't have to talk about global climate change. They don't have to believe. Um, and that was really important up until about 18 months ago, I'd say, where now things have changed where I think public opinion kind of is like, oh, actually, maybe this is real, um, has really shifted. But until recently, um, it, you would do these exact same things for a whole lot of other different reasons. Um, and the second point really is because we added up the numbers and we can really show where the emissions have changed, what we realize is that all of this happened because literally millions and millions of decisions were made every day by thousands and thousands of people that reduced energy use. And it did it because people made specific decisions to buy something different or, um, or basically to do something different. So every decision you make every day, when I think about sustainability, this is how I try to explain it to people. It's like, you know, everything we do today affects the future and, and the world that our kids are going to inherit. And so, you know, how you got here today, what the lights are like in the room, what food you ate today, how far it came from, you know, whether there were pesticides on it, all the different, you know, all the different kinds of things that you do every single day, you think don't have much of an impact because you're just one person. But when you add up the numbers, you find out that actually millions of little decisions really do add up. So I just think that's really important. So what has been happening? Um, to start out with transportation, so from 1990 to 2006, gasoline use fell by 13% per capita. Vehicle miles traveled fell by 7%. We've had an 85% increase in transit ridership, and this is while our population increased by about 15% during that time. Um, as most of you know who have been there, you can get off the plane, get on the light rail, go downtown, and all the transit is free downtown. So, those are some of the things that make it so that it's actually really easy not to have a car. Um, we also have about 40 miles of light rail and street trolley. Um, one of the other things that's really changed on the transportation front is bicycle riding. So bicycling, this is a, a graph that shows the, um, both the bicycle traffic and the, the uh, number of miles of uh, bicycle network in terms of the actual um, in either, either separated bikeways or in street bikeways. So we've increased the amount of bicycle miles by about 240%, and at the same time, bicycle ridership has gone up about 410%. And this kind of is the whole idea that you need to make it safe for people. You need to have a place for people to ride, and if you do build the infrastructure, you know, build it and they will ride. They will come and people will, will want to use the infrastructure. Um, so we started doing bicycle counts. Um, the way Portland is is there's, this is Portland, and there's a river in the middle. And one side is sort of, let me flip this over. <coughs> one side is um, a big park, basically. The whole west side is hills, and it's streets, and it's very beautiful. And then the other side is very much flat and grid-like, and it looks like a real city with little small blocks that are very walkable and all. And so we started doing measurements. Downtown is actually on the west side just before all those hills. So we started doing bicycle counts of people going over the river to work. And a few years ago, the number was around 5,000 people a day, which we thought was pretty amazing. Well, last summer we did counts over and over every day, and the average was 14,000 people a day riding their bikes to work downtown. So that doesn't happen. And yet the infrastructure didn't change that much in the past couple of years. So that doesn't happen just because you build stuff. It happens because, at least I believe, it's sort of a social norm. It's become cool to ride your bike. And so you can be you know, a high-paid planner like these guys here, or a high-paid lawyer, or something else. And it's cool to walk into a meeting with you know, a helmet head and your helmet in your hand. And it's begun sort of like you get to work and people say, did you ride? And you're like, uh, you know, and so you want to tell people, it's be just become a part of sort of the social fabric. Um, there's contests between companies. Every September we have a huge contest um, between companies all over town. About 800 companies um, compete basically to see how many people will ride to work and how many miles and all of this. And, and the numbers keep going up and up. So it's, it's a very, it's kind of silly. But it's also, once you do it once, you go, oh, I didn't have to go work out today. 
And I actually save time. You think it's going to take you longer, but it's kind of in the whole package of things. Um, it becomes something that a lot of people are doing, even if they just do it like once a week or so. So besides transportation, energy efficiency is a huge part of sustainability and of reducing um, carbon emissions. We have um, pretty strong energy codes in Portland. My understanding is that in Arizona, you don't actually have energy codes at the state level, and it's up to cities whether or not they want to um, adopt those. Um, we actually have kind of a reverse, which the state has an energy code. It's, it's a pretty good and thorough one. It's about as strong as California's, which is at the top of the nation. But if we want to go beyond it, if we wanted to have a building code sort of like the LEED green building standards, do, how many of you know what LEED green building is? So some of you, so it's a sort of a point-based system that basically looks at energy efficiency in water and wastewater and materials, and you get a certain amount of points, pretty much beyond where anyone naturally or, or builds to regular code, and you can, you can be a part of this LEED-based system. Well, if we wanted to adopt that as code, we can't. So we're looking for ways to get around that because the state basically sets the limits, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so for city facilities, one of the things we know is that even the council members who don't really care much about environmental issues, they all care about saving money. So starting when I first got this job, we started running as fast as we could on looking at our own facilities. So we're now saving about 22% on our energy bills from where we were and it's about two and a half million dollars a year. So that's very real. They don't have to care about the environment at all to care about saving money. And it's a really good example for business because we can't be out working with businesses and then having not done um, stuff to our own facilities and, and to our own system. Um, so since 1990, it's also really taken off in the residential sector. We're now at about 5% less um, energy use per household. It's not a huge amount, but it is in the right direction. And these houses are actually bigger than they used to be in 1990 because all these homes still get bigger and bigger. Although somebody was telling me this morning that the homes being built, and I don't know which neighborhood or which city, you know, that like 5,000 square, square feet is not unusual. And so <laughs> she keeps saying Scottsdale over there. So um, when that's another social norm. If, even if you're a multimillionaire in Portland, you would not build that home because you would be embarrassed to do that. And it's this weird sort of thing. And so that wasn't true again, you know, eight years ago out in the suburbs. There were homes being built like that. But I think it's just sort of this sort of social norm of if you have a lot of money, you actually want the coolest house downtown or within three miles of right downtown. So I don't, I don't know how all of this happens and how it, how it gets there, but that's sort of where we are. Could you comment on uh, how real estate developers would view that issue? Because here, one of the main motivations for big houses is that they charge by the square foot, and there's more profit on the larger houses. Right. Um, I don't think there's demand for it. We have, in the city of Portland, we actually only have about maybe 1,500 homes built new a year, and that number keeps going down because there's no single-family home lots left. We have a whole lot of multifamily and a lot of very expensive condos that I could not move into right downtown and within a mile of downtown. So most of those are filled with either people who have retired and had the bigger houses in the suburb, and they want to live in a place where they can walk out the door and go to dinner and take, you know, do everything they need without a car. Or it's filled with people who are 26 years old and just came from San Francisco and it's cheaper than a regular house there. And so that's, it's sort of a mix of very sort of retirement and 25 to 35 year old, no kids, um, folks with, that have just come from the Bay Area predominantly. Um, so a big shift, I think, is you know, one of the things I think you're kind of getting at is that um, we kind of thought you know, as planners 10 or 15 years ago when we were drawing out the light rail lines just like you guys are now and saying you got to do increased density along it, that somehow this was all going to work. And the amazing thing is actually when you go to buy a house, you will pay a lot more for a house that's within a quarter mile of the light rail or a really good bus line than you will anywhere else. And so that's now been proven mm -hmm. and it's something people ask for when they're buying homes and stuff. And so, and the same thing for work. There's now pressure to have your business downtown because your employees don't want to drive. 
They want to be able to just get on the light rail, get to work, and and you know, and get back home and not have this thing out in the suburbs somewhere. So all that's kind of just changing, and part of that change is you know, you build a livable community, and then people who are 20 to 35 who are really well educated and, and it's, you know, the same thing is, is sort of true here too. It's people who are really well educated want to come to a good environment and they want to live in a cool place and they're picking Portland on purpose. And so it's just kind of self-reinforcing. Um, Absolutely, in terms of, I mean, because ridership is, you know, something like eight times what they ever thought it was going to be in terms of the light rail, definitely. And obviously, transit ridership has gone up 85%. Is it still awful to be on the, what's called the Sunset Highway that heads west out towards um, Nike and Intel where probably, you know, 60, 70,000 people work? Yeah, it's awful. But the, the thing that's changed is people used to, um, live out there and work out there and then go into town every once in a while, which is sort of the norm. Now the people who are moving to Portland who are primarily young engineers from all over the world, because that's how Intel works, um, they all want to live downtown so the reverse commute is happening. They're all leaving, but they can take the light rail right to the thing. So, so yeah, traffic is still bad. And that's actually, um, that's partly by design. So it's a really bad, awful two-lane freeway. And on purpose, all the transportation planners and land use planners are like, yeah, let's keep it that way, because then everybody will have to ride light rail. And if it was really quick and easy, then, then it would. The schools are good. And that's actually, you know, that's our biggest economic development, you know, approach, is you've got to keep the schools good. Um, is every school great? You know, elementary schools are incredibly good. And it kind of goes from there until you get to. Yeah, I think they're the same, you know, pretty much. I mean, I'm not sure that, I'd say 90, it's something like 93% of people send their kids to public school. So in an urban area, that's pretty unusual, I think, in that kind of an urban area. Um, so on the LEED Green Building Standards, um, back in 2000, when we started the office, the first thing we did was say that all, we went to council and um, they passed an ordinance that said any new city facility needs to be lead. Of course, it was really easy because we were like building a fire station that year and that was it. And so we weren't like in this big growth thing. And so I'm like, okay, go now because we're just doing a fire station this year. Um, that's moved up over the years and it's now lead gold and we are building occasionally, but not a lot. The second part of it that really makes a huge difference is we said that any new commercial building or apartment building, multifamily, affordable housing that gets any kind of an incentive from the city, so that could be um, what's called tax increment financing it's, or having your uh, property tax put off for several years because you're building in a certain area. Uh, there's a lot of incentives for affordable housing and those happen to one extent or another in every metropolitan area. And so we said if you get that, any kind of city money, you also have to meet LEED. And that's now at LEED Silver. And that changed everything because all the developers and architects and such that wanted to get that project, whatever it was, whether it was a, you know, 80-unit apartment building or, or build a new um, development um, that was a private development but that got some kind of funding, they learned how to do it quick. Um, and what that really did was create an entire industry. Um, that wasn't what we were trying to do. We thought what we were doing was some kind of environmental thing, but what ended up happening is that there's now hundreds and hundreds of architects and engineers and designers and developers that know how to build to lead and beyond and um, know how to do it cost effectively because they've done several buildings. So they're working in LA and San Francisco and they're probably working here and they're working in China a lot too um, in terms of exporting basically this, this knowledge and development. Um, so we all know LEED's not perfect. There's a lot of problems with it, but it's kind of the best thing um, that we have right now, so we, we've been using it. Um, we also had a discussion <coughs> earlier, so any of you who care about LEED is about whether you should really just let businesses 
have to do it all but not get certified because the certification costs money and you have to do all jump through these hoops. But we really, really felt that the, the process wouldn't be genuine unless you actually have them go through the hoops and actually prove that they've commissioned the buildings, that they've gone through all the things that you need to do basically to meet lead. And so we've pretty much stuck with it. Um, that picture there in the corner with the tall red tower used to be the, the Henry Weinhardt breweries. And so that's now about two million or two and a half million square feet of um, office space and housing. And so, and it's uh, a lead gold building. So there's 150 lead certified buildings in the metro area either completed or that will, are underway. And um, it's a pretty big number for a port. You know, I think we're the most in the US right now, but all the big cities will go zooming by us, Sue, because. Yeah, they, we all do. That's sort of what we do. <laughs> They're probably right. For that, for that red building that yeah. was, that's now office, did they use LEED for existing buildings, or did, did you use LEED for new It was before EB was around. Okay. So it was that was 2002, I think, or right around there that they completed it. So it was one of the first buildings. But it has, it has an eco roof. It has, like, you name it. It has you know all the bells and whistles. and. Huh. Um, the interesting thing is the guy who's the developer of that, so it's a, a company called Girding Edlin, um, they're probably the largest, they are the largest developer in Portland, is um, they've sort of become zealots. And so they're my, they're my strongest ally because I can get all sorts of environmentalists to come with me and say all these things. And I can get him or one of the, develop, one of the, the leads of that company to come with me. I, I can usually only get their time very scheduled for 10 minutes, but I can get them to come with me and say, you know, we're making money hand over fist doing this. And that, that's a really different story than we should do this to clean up the environment. And so that's, I think, really important. Um, so besides energy efficiency and transportation, there's renewable energy. And um, so in Portland, it's a little less focused on solar maybe than here because our weather is slightly different. But we do have a lot of solar going on too. Um, the focus is primarily on wind power. Um, there's about 500 megawatts of wind uh, farms built up in the Columbia Gorge. So that first picture I showed you of the river, up between, mo the river basically divides Oregon and Washington most of the way. And up near the gorge, the wind is great and it's mostly farmland that otherwise is just grazing land um, or wheat. And so farmers are very, very excited about this new opportunity um, to make money there. There's about 2,000 megawatts of potential there with good transmission right nearby, and it can be developed as cheap as any natural gas plant. And so that's an amazing resource, and that I predict it'll all be built out in the next 10 years. Um, so uh, to, for people who aren't energy geeks like me, um, 50 megawatts is about the n amount of power in Oregon anyways that maybe 12,000 homes use. So it's it's a lot of power, it's, you know, it's a lot. So um, we have a renewable portfolio standard. I understand Arizona's is, I think, 15% by 2025. That means that the energy that is um, generated, electricity, between now and 2025, 15% of it needs to be from new renewable resources, and in Oregon is 25%, but it's the same idea, and it's really pushing the marketplace um, what's kind of more interesting for me is in that 2001 uh, action plan on global warming, so how many of you have ever helped develop any kind of a plan? Transportation, energy, land use, so a few of you. So when you do those plans, the funny thing is you just start making up stuff. You start going, well, I think in the next 10 years or whatever the thing is, we could do this. And you, you basically have some basis in reality, but you're, it's also kind of a wish list. Well, one of the things I put in there was, oh, by 2010, because it was nine years away, we're <laughs> going to be 100% renewable power for city government, and it's about $17 um, million dollars of power a year, and that's Oregon electricity prices, so it's probably $25 million worth of power here a year, and somehow that's just going to happen. Well, you know, you suddenly wake up a few years later and like, oh, I want to keep my job, so I better figure <laughs> out how to do this, and it's, it's sort of been put to me that way in the past year. And so <clears throat> two years ago, we went to our electric utilities and sort of got a price for what it would cost for them to go get us this much wind power. And um, 
if any of you are, know much about the utility industry, you're basically stuck with them because that's your electricity provider. Um, one of the things in Oregon is if you're a large customer, you can actually buy your power from someone else, the power component, and the electric u local utility has to take that power and bring it to your door. Um, it doesn't actually work that way. It all just goes into the system, but it's on paper it has to all happen like that. So we said, okay, well, we're just going to see who would do it for us. So we put out a request for proposals, and we got four really good proposals. Um, and then the fun kind of began of no one had ever done this before, and how do you have a legal contract between a city that's not a utility and a private company is going to build you a wind farm, and how does the power actually get there? And so we've actually spent two years of lawyering back and forth and disagreeing, and then as soon as a deal would be right, ready to go, someone would outbid us and just come in with a really easy contract because they're a utility and they've done this 500 times. And so we finally, finally have a project all lined up, and hopefully in the next couple of months I'll be able to send you a letter and email and say, yay, we finally did it. And the project is going to be in central Oregon, and it's more directly related to um, small projects, 5, 10 megawatts. It's going to be 50 megawatts total um, of power. And um, the advantage, again, is sort of this connection between the city and a rural area, which is really important to the city when we get down to the state legislature. Anything we can do to build a connection between Portland which is very liberal and very, you know, everything that, that the rest of Oregon is not. Um, we we want to do those things to build that relationship. So these wind farms will be on farmers' properties and in counties where those counties now will get a whole big increase in their property tax base because these wind farms will be on their on county land or, or just on private land, but within the county. So they're very excited about it. The farmers are excited about it. And it's like a direct relationship between we're going to be basically taking money that used to go to our electric utility, which went to, you know, to basically their, their board of directors and all the other people who own shares in the company. And now this money's going to come right between two parts of Oregon. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. And hopefully, hopefully it'll be done in the next, um, actually the project is going to be done either way in the next probably 18 months, but whether we're going to end up the owner or not is, is still the paperwork we're trying to, to finish. Um, the sun does shine occasionally in Oregon, and if you come downtown and you don't take transit and you didn't ride your bike and you didn't walk and you park your car and you're really tall, you can look on the top of the parking meters and they're all solar. And um, there's solar on various city buildings and pools and fire stations and on uh, maintenance vans, some of the maintenance vans downtown they're doing work on, uh, you know, sewer or different kinds of things. They have solar, so they don't have to run their stinky diesel engine in the streets. And so um, that's another thing that's going on. We have a solar um, campaign going on right now, <coughs> trying to get several hundred new whoops, several hundred new solar systems on businesses and residents. And I was doing this earlier this morning for a group of architects, and they pointed out that this guy has his bike helmet on up there, and we haven't. <laughs> I think I haven't really figured that one out yet, but for some reason, maybe it's just attached to his head or something. I think, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's just kind of cool. He doesn't even want to take it off. So um, anyway, it's it's a really being run as a campaign, and the campaign idea is, um, I was just explaining this a few minutes ago, is we went and found. You know who, actually the person I hired to run it is a campaign manager of, of you know, a whole bunch of city council races and state legislative races and she got these people elected. So she knows how to go find people with money and you have them give them money to get something done. So she went to her list of somewhat wealthy people list who are also environmentalists and we invited them all to a party and at the party we basically said, you all have told us for years that you know, you're environmentalists, well now show us and you know, make a commitment um, to solar. And uh, they did. And we had 50 of them sign up either for their businesses and different buildings throughout town or for their own um, personal residence. And part of the deal was, if you do it, then we will tell everyone your story. And so we're helping to get their story in the paper and the business journal and the different places. And we also are having them sort of, anybody who's been involved in campaigns know it's all about the house parties. So we actually are then having them tell their friends, basically, and get their friends to do the same thing. So 
it's weird when you think about why renewables don't happen in, in a community, and people say it's because it costs too much. And that's not really why. I mean, it's a little bit why. But it's also because it's messy and it's hard to do, and they, they don't know who the contractors are, and they don't know how to get the tax credits, and it's a big pain. And so what we've done mostly is set up sort of, I call it a concierge service, where we just help them handhold them through the process. Um, and we're doing the same thing with just regular people. <laughs> um, and so we now have had um, 10 workshops, and 150 people have shown up at each of the workshops who are ready to go, but they don't know what to do. And so we're basically kind of hand-holding them through um, and hope to get several hundred uh, done in the next year or two. Um, other electricity projects. So this is out at our wastewater treatment plant. So every city has a wastewater treatment plant, and all of them have sewage gas. It's lovely. And um, most of them flare it just right there because you can't just let it go up into the atmosphere. And so we've set... Um, that's a set of micro turbines. We also have sort of a big, sort of like a jet engine, basically. And it will generate um, about $600,000 worth of power a year it generates out there. And all that can be used right on site. So it's just, any city should be doing this. We should all be doing this. It's just something that's been a waste resource um, for years. So renewables isn't just about electricity. It's also about other fuels, and um, this summer Portland became the first city in the country to have a biofuel standard for all transportation fuels. So if you come to Portland and you drive your car and you go to fill up and you have a diesel vehicle, you get 5% biodiesel. You don't know you're getting it, but you are getting it. And you get 10% ethanol. And there's all sorts of discussion about the value of biodiesel and ethanol made from corn and all of these sorts of things, and we know that that's all true. Um, that whether or not it really is a global warming, greenhouse gas savings. But what we do know is in the long run that biodiesel from canola or wood waste or agricultural waste in Oregon or switchgrass um, and other things for ethanol, that that is um, both cost effective and from a greenhouse gas perspective a huge savings. So we're trying to build demand and infrastructure right now and Oregon State University is, has several huge research grants where they're working with farmers basically to grow the crops that, that are the right crops in terms of that. Um, so we're building demand for our own city vehicles. Um, we use pretty much 50% biodiesel in all the vehicles except for the Water Bureau who wants to outdo everybody and so they have 99% biodiesel. Um, I oversee garbage so I made all the garbage trucks go to 20% biodiesel. Uh, and it's, it's just kind of... Um, Moved on from there, I can't remember if I was saying this a minute ago or not because I've done a couple presentations today, but just like the wind thing mm -hmm. on biodiesel, we're actually buying it from a particular farmer for the city vehicles where we help them pay for a crusher for the canola. Canola is like kind of like a mustard plant. And so we're, we're helping him pay for that crusher. He's creating the biodiesel. He has somebody else that mixing it, bringing it, bringing it to us. And so again, it's this really nice direct connection with particular people and farmers in Central Oregon with, with the city. Um, so this is one family's recycling for a year, I think including that really ugly couch that they're sitting on, um, <laughs> which I think they reused. They gave it to Goodwill and somebody else took it away. Um, so another way to impact greenhouse gases is by buying less stuff in the first place, by reusing it and then also by recycling. Um, when you add up all the carbon dioxide emissions and methane, basically emissions is what that, that really means, um, it's the equivalent of taking off 100,000 cars a year off the road in Portland. So we have a 63% um, um, recycling rate for commercial and residential all added up together. Our plan is to go to 75% um, by 2015. And if you all are interested in recycling or waste reduction, I can talk about that more in the question and answers. The main areas where we need to grow are actually in almost every city, three-fourths of the garbage is commercial. It's business. And so you can do all this great curbside recycling, and it ends up that most, and you can recycle everything. And if you don't do anything about business recycling, you're missing the whole picture. And so that's something that's real important. And that probably a quarter of the garbage is food waste. Food waste and soiled, food soiled paper and pizza boxes and stuff like that. Um, so that's something we're going after. We're basically going to ban. This is a new, we've all been voluntary for all these years. And um, this is another political thing where 
I have a council right now until November when some of them will be off that I know will we'll work with this. And I don't know what happens come November or actually sooner than that when they're elected. So, you know, I'm trying to move some of this fast and, and it's food waste and construction and demolition debris. So that's another quarter really of what's in the garbage. And most of that is wood and glass and metal that can all be recycled. So we're working on, on those two areas. Um, let's see what else. Financing. So the reason all this kind of works in Portland is because we've had really great financial incentives, especially on the energy and renewable side, for a really long time, going back to the mid-80s. We had a business energy tax credit of 35% for projects, so 35% of the, of the cost of the project can be taken off of their um, income tax, their business income tax, and if it's a solar project, as of this year, it's 50%. So if you have a solar project and you're a business, you can get 50% from the state and another about 20% from the federal government and another 10% sort of from the utility energy efficiency program. So there's almost no reason not to do it um, at this point. Residents have a 25% energy tax credit for energy efficiency or renewables. We have state tax credits um, for LEED. So if you build to LEED, there's also a certain dollar per square foot uh, reduction. And then we have something called the Energy Trust of Oregon where 3% of all of electricity bills in the state goes into a fund in, um, I'm not sure if this works the same in Arizona, but in California, all that money gets added up and it goes back to the utilities who run energy conservation programs. They did theirs first and we thought that didn't sound very good because it's like you're giving money back to the utilities who want to sell power and telling them to tell their customers not to buy more power. And so it just seemed this thing of, this is not a good idea for electric utilities, from my perspective, to run energy efficiency programs because their heart can never really be in it because it's always, they're selling less of their product. Um, that's not to say that some people in those companies aren't doing a really great job. It's just in general, there's no real huge incentive um, to do it. So we have a nonprofit and it's about $70 million a year that goes into that for renewable resource and energy efficiency projects. Um, we also have something called the Climate Trust in Oregon. Um, you know, in general in the U.S., there's not really a carbon market yet like there is beginning to be in Europe. It's definitely not mature, but, but there is some informal markets dealing with carbon. And um, I won't go into this a lot, but if you all have questions, I could talk individually after. So starting in 2002, we were looking for funding for how to get weatherization projects done in apartment buildings. Because there were all these incentives out there, but the property owners weren't taking advantage of them because they don't pay the utility bills. So if you think of any rental situation, you know, basically the, the renter pays the bills, but the property owner has the ability to fix up the property and do weatherization and such. So there was a real disconnect. So we for a while had some um, grant money from the U.S. Department of Energy to do some of this work, and we found all we had to do was market, and market the, live, the increased, you know, less rental turnover, in, increased comfort of the building. We didn't talk about energy savings because the owner didn't care. We showed that if you just marketed to these people, they would actually do it. So we went to the Climate Trust and said, if you give us just the marketing money, we will go get, we'll, for every dollar, we'll raise you know, hundreds of dollars, basically, to more than that. It, we ended up raising $20 million um, in private investment for about a million dollars of their investment for, for weatherizing um, apartment buildings, which means adding insulation and doing um, uh, you know, lighting retrofits and those kinds of things in the apartments. So the projects wouldn't have happened without the money. So these are truly additional projects. They wouldn't have happened otherwise. And also, um, the, uh, the, the savings were just, um, they're currently not really owned by anyone because there's not a real market. And so the property owners of all these buildings didn't care that they were signing over their carbon to the city to go do this. Where my guess is, you know, 5, 10, 15 years from now, that's not going to be the case. We're all going to have some kind of value, especially companies who have large industrial companies who aren't going to do those projects otherwise. They will have something to sell, basically, in terms of carbon credits. And that's a whole other story. Um, 
So what's coming up next? Uh, we had a group of citizens who cared a lot about the issue of peak oil and the issue more, more or less of uh, volatile oil prices and volatile supplies and what does that actually do to a community? What happens? And so they ran a bunch of scenarios and as a lot of things happen in the city, if they go to city council and it's something, anything vaguely re re related to sustainability or environment or energy, they just hand it to me and say, go do this without any money. And then, um, so we brought all these citizens together and then we brought a bunch of experts together um, from the U.S. Department of Energy, from our Department of Energy and others. And we basically looked at, so what happens if suddenly the price of oil goes, you know, the price of gasoline goes to eight bucks? Or what happens to heating oil for lower income families? What happens to all these things? And we found pretty quickly that um, the issues that are important are that the social issues that are hard to deal with now in terms of homelessness, in terms of food for lower income families, in terms of them getting around transportation, all just become worse. So for most of us, yeah, we'll have to pay more and it's not really gonna affect us. But for people on the margin, um, those people are gonna be affected dramatically. And so that made it a social issue. And it's beginning to translate over to people who care about homelessness and low income housing and affordability and, um, and minority issues about having that all be like, oh, we should actually care about what are we gonna do to reduce and have Portland be ready so that when this happens, it doesn't really affect those people as much. So a lot of those things are having transit available. All the same things we were doing anyways, it just gives more reasons for why you wanted to do it. So they set a goal, as Portland would do, of cutting fossil fuel use by f in half within 25 years. And again, to do this for economic development reasons, to do these for environmental reasons, but also for social. And then a couple weeks ago, um, they decided they want to update that plan. And they want to change the global warming goal from 10% reduction to what scientists say is really needed, which is an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And then they asked mm -hmm. me to have the plan done by summer. So if you have any good ideas, send them <laughs> to me. Um, so we're really excited about that one component again uh, of that plan that's going to be that we just um, announced but have not gotten adopted yet through council, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna happen is something we're calling a rebate and fee bait. So how many, are there any economists in this room? Oh, oh good, I can make all of this up then. <laughs> so, I mean, the basic idea is you want to pay people to do stuff that you want them to do, and you want to have fees and disincentives and taxes on things you don't want them to do. And that's sort of a basic economic <laughs> theory of how you get people to change behavior. That's not how our economy works. We tax things like um, income and people working, which is actually something we want to do, which is really crazy. And we really should be taxing things like air pollution or water pollution or something like that. So we took this idea and we did it towards building construction. So what I was saying in the beginning is we can't just go adopt a new building code. We had to get around that somehow. So what we're gonna do is basically, if you just meet code, the energy code in Oregon, you're gonna have to pay a fee, a carbon fee, equal to the amount of carbon released over the next 50 or 60 years of life of that building, or some amount like that. If you go beyond the code, if it's 30% more efficient, you don't have to pay the fee. And we found, we chose that number because there are a lot of builders already, both in homes and in new construction that are getting there, and they're getting there without any kind of market incentive and you can do it for just about the same cost as doing the other things if you're a smart builder. And then if you go 45% more efficient, so that's about like a lead platinum building on the com commercial side and a really super efficient home on the residential side, you actually will get a check from the city that comes from all of the fees being paid by all the other people who haven't figured it out yet. And so we're gonna do this as a way to basically change all new construction um, in the city over time. And a lot of those fees in the early couple of years will also be used for an extensive training. So we have, we have, we currently have two people full time that do nothing but work with architects, engineers, um, developers, homeowners, working on um, promoting green building and basically giving them good technical ideas on how to move forward. 
um, five years ago that was really unusual. Now we have you know hundreds of architects who know as much as those two people do, and so it's really it's really shifted the marketplace. The other idea that will be in the plan for sure is again for exist that was for new construction. This is for um, existing construction, <laughs> and so when we have um, a home being sold. You need you will need to do a green building rating at that time. So if I sell my house to you, you'll basically know that my house is an 84 on the 100 scale, and this other house over here you were going to buy is a 40. And so without having anything else but that information, it then becomes a negotiating tool. So when you buy my house, you may say, "Fine, but I want a new roof, and you know I want it to be a higher score on that." So you need to go do this insulation, and it becomes something that at this point nobody has that information. What Oakland and San Francisco and Berkeley are working on together, and then we're just waiting until they get it all done, and then we're going to hopefully take all that information, <laughs> is we've already worked it out with them. We, we said, you guys have so much more money than we do, especially San Francisco. So they're taking the next step and saying, after you do that, you actually have to meet some higher standard. And at time of sale, we'll have to make some improvements to the building. And so um, I don't think I have the residential real estate community behind me to be able to do that. I could probably do it on commercial side because nobody owns commercial buildings, only a few people, and you just have to get past them. But from a political point of view, the residential will be really, really hard to do. So those are some of the things um, that are going on. A couple other projects real quick. We have a new um, one-stop kind of information center. Um, how many of you work in businesses? Look out. You're all students, okay? Well, a few of you. You must work somewhere. Um, so you get out of school and you go get a job, and they say, please, you know, and, and it has 2,000 employees, and they want you to be the person that greens up the company. And that happens all the time now in the city where people are like, well, we want to green up, but we don't know where to start. And somebody has 10% of their job suddenly has this thrown on them. And they go figure out where to get bus passes for their employees and how to do water conservation. and how to get the electric utility audits, and the list goes on and on. And they have to call 17 different places. And so we're making it all, we've worked with all the groups finally, this took like five years, and said, we're just gonna have one number and one, you know, one huge website that all this stuff is connected to so that you can just call one number and get help on all of these things and get referrals. So um, it's one of those things that's, again, really simple, but um, something that, that will really, really build demand um, and implementation. We have a new green building hotline, similar kind of thing, where it's one stop. You can call and get answers on green building. Um, it's for the whole metro area. And then I talked a little bit about the improvements in curbside, um, or I did on the commercial side. On curbside recycling, the thing that we're changing is um, sometime during the next year, it'll be implemented slowly, is you'll have one big roll cart that all your recycling goes in, except for glass, which will be on the side. And that'll get picked up every week. You'll have another big roll can where all your yard debris goes in and all your food waste and meat and pizza boxes and any paper soiled stuff will all go in. And then hopefully you'll just have this little teeny garbage can and we're only going to pick it up every other week. <laughs> and if you want to have it every week, you get charged more. And this is again one of those things, sort of the plan <laughs> idea where you go, Let's just try it. And you threw it out to council, and they went for it, you know, in a rare moment. And um, so that's what we're proposing to do. And um, you can get it picked up every week. You'll just have to pay $2 more or something. It'll be, it'll be in, in the realm of not really expensive to have it picked up more. But um, it's just one of those things we think kind of makes a statement, too, that, oh, look, when you recycle all this stuff and you put all this stuff in the compost, there's nothing left. Unfortunately, the things that'll be left will be diapers, we figured. That's the only, the disposable <laughs> diapers. Those will be a little messy, but. So, um, sum up is we have um, done a lot. We started early. We're headed in the right direction. I, a friend of mine said this to me the other day. They said, well, yeah, amongst all these cities, you're getting an A plus, but compared to where we need to go, you're getting an F. You know, you, all you've done is gone back to 1990 levels. We need to get an 80% reduction. And I think that that's the truth. That's the scary thing that we have to wake up to, um, is that it's really going to be hard to do that. And to do that, we need to make some really big investments in renewables and energy efficiency and green building. And I think the good news is I think it can actually happen. I think it can happen cost effectively. And I think there's a lot of actually money to be made 
um, in doing that. And um, I think as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we have literally hundreds of architects, engineers, developers, green building um, various materials being made in Oregon because of sort of this environmental thing. And um, here's a list of some of the companies that are, that are doing this work. And they've shown that you can make a profit at this. Quick question. Um, if anybody wants to ask Susan anything. We're all good. Oh, yeah. Question about the, the cycling. Um, San Francisco has this critical mass ride right. Right, every year. And so besides just the sort of norming of it, is, is cycling reaching a point where enough people on the road that they recognize there's an alternative form of transportation not suddenly you're pushed to the side of your automobile, but it's Right. Um, we're up to like 5% of all trips being made are made by bicycle, which is times the average. Um, so yes, they're out there. And yes, the main point is drivers are aware now. Um, unfortunately, there's been a couple fatalities this year where people were in big trucks and little bike right next to them, and they turned, la they turned right. Um, so we're talking about changing it so that the bikes get to go up front at every stoplight. You know, basically the bikes go to the front like they do in Europe. You wait till the light turns green and then they go back into the bike lane. Um, yeah, we have the, we have the same ride. Our, our mayor went on it the first year. In his recumbent, he's a pretty big guy. In the recumbent bicycle, he went, he went and led the thing. We have a nude bicycle ride also in case anyone wants to date. We do that too, so. So do employers provide storage and other needs so that- Showers are pretty important. Yep, yeah. yep. So, um, no, bikes get stolen, you know, it happens everywhere. That's sort of the way it is. But um, we're looking at, there's a system in um, Lyon and in some other European city, cities, and it's like car share. We have a car sharing thing, flex car. But it's the same idea, and you basically come up, you swipe your card in there, and the first 25 or 30 minutes are free, and then you just ride your bike where you want to go, and then you put it back in and you lock it up. And so we're looking at how to do that um, in Portland, too. Um, we have this boundary, so in some ways, no. The boundary's out there a bit, and we're just really hitting up against it now. Um, so the metro area itself has kind of reached the capacity, and it looks, it definitely looks different. The footprint looks different if you were to look at, um, uh, you know, the heights of buildings and all those things in Portland than it does here. You just don't have sprawling, you know, most of downtown Portland and within seven miles of downtown are lots that are, you know, 50 by 100, 65 by 100. So they're, they're relatively small urban lots. Um, if you get out in the suburbs, parts of it look just like anywhere else, you know, in the, in the U.S. And um, so it's easy to bike ride, especially on the east side, except we do have a little bit of rain. And so it, there is a big hurdle to get over in terms of wanting to bike in the rain. Yeah. Um, what type of uh, initiatives do you see going on in, like, Hillsborough and Beaverton, the more suburban areas, you know, that are maybe more analogous to mm -hmm. development in, you know, the Phoenix area that could maybe more easily right. be over more affordable? Um, the big thing there, I think, is that they're understanding that one of the things that they need to do is be a little Portland-like so that there are places where people can live and walk and get to the store and not have to drive just to get a gallon of milk. And so they're building town centers which are right near the light rail, and which might have literally 2,000 housing units within a quarter mile or a half mile of the, of the station. Um, so that's a big change. And they're, just like every other city in the U.S. of any size, they have their one or two token lead buildings, and they're very proud of them. Um, so I think that's, that's part of it. The other thing that's happened, though, is that, unfortunately, from my perspective, is the lower income and minority communities in Portland are getting pushed out because you have people who want to live really close in, and these are cool old houses that were kind of abandoned, you know, from the 20s and even, you know, early 1900s, even late 1890s. And those homes are now being taken over by people who have money, and those people are having to move out. And so they now have more transportation costs to get back in, and, you know, it's, it's actually cheaper to live out there in terms of apartments and such, but so that's, it's kind of a gentrification that's not really good. Have you seen any projects that have adopted new neighborhood development? Or been 
we, we have like six pilots in the pilot that's going on. We have like six different, yeah. So those are happening soon, or they're underway right now. We're, we're working with them really close, so the planning department is offering extra technical assistance. It ends up that most of how we're already doing those developments, it's like, oh, we're already doing this, check, 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 you know. And it's sort of a funny, that was one of the reasons none of them wanted to do it originally. And I was like, no, we, we need Portland to be in on these pilots. Just to, it's the same thing, you kind of need the certification to, to, to show it and, and approve. And, um, but they're also having to do certain things that they wouldn't have done otherwise, which I think it's good. Yeah, likely buildings, definitely, and the whole EB, the existing building. Could you talk a little more about the carbon credit uh, program or policy that you have, or that are for, for, let's say, for businesses that can't meet their reduction, someone else is selling them. So we don't have a carbon program of any sort okay. officially, except for this, the building code thing I was talking about, and that hopefully will be adopted in the next few months for, about. For, for the rebate, re, re, Yeah, okay, rebate right. So that's, that's what we're proposing, and okay. that will be hopefully adopted in the next few months. And, you know, basically there you're either doing what we want to have happen, which is meet this higher building standard, or you're having to pay a fee. And that's for both housing and, and for commercial development. Um, other than that, there's no, car and we're just, we were just trying to find a hook because we can't, as a city, just adopt a higher building code because the state doesn't let us. Boston, for example. But, and you're, but you're not restricted to, you, you're not restricted to building higher, like the weed or even better than weed. You just can't adopt it as a city, right? Right. No, we can, we can, well, we're, we're, we're worried that what we're doing, so all we're doing is going around the law. And so as soon as we said we were going to do this, this happens a lot in Oregon, is there's only one city over 500,000 people. So a law will be written that says, all cities over 500,000 you know, aren't allowed to adopt a carbon standard or aren't allowed to do whatever it is that Portland wants to do. So right now we have, for the first time. That's crazy. Yeah, but it happens all the time. And th for the first time in almost ever, we have a democratically controlled legislature, and that's almost, so Portland is this one little island in a very conservative state. Um, it's, you know, it's a different kind of place. Well, we could require all new construction to meet a new level. We could require all existing to meet a new level. We could, you know, um, give huge incentives for taking transit. You could require, you know, in every community to have a whole lot more density. You could, you know, all those ideas and more will be in the plan, hopefully, by <laughs> what I come up with by June. Um, you absolutely have to have federal standards that increase fuel efficiency for cars. You have to have, you know, appliance standards. There's a whole bunch of stuff that only the federal government can do. Um, state governments try to do it sometimes. They do it piecemeal. And occasionally cities try to do it, and then the state tells them they can't. And That's California did. Yeah, exactly. And so we did exactly what California did. And again, let them go through the lawsuit and let them go through all that. <laughs> and we let them pay, you know. <laughs> But the same idea. Uh, I have one more question. Okay. Oh, yeah. Or two. There you go. I was going to say, um, do you think you'd ever adopt a carbon coding program, kind of like Chicago Climate Change, to adopt the new regulations? We are in the climate. So we were like the first city we signed up for the thing because we kind of felt like we should. And so, yeah, so we're a member of Chicago Climate Exchange, which is a group that basically says you're going to reduce your emissions. Companies sign up to be a part of it, or cities can. We're going to reduce our emissions by 1% a year, I think, is what, what it says. And if you don't, you can buy somebody else's savings from somewhere else. And if you do a whole lot more, you could actually sell them. And so we've been able to meet it. We don't actually want to sell any of ours because we want to keep credit for it. Um, so that's part of the thing. And um, 
Yeah, the, the Chicago Climate Exchange also has, if you want to talk about it, they have some real, I think they have some real issues in terms of the quality of their offsets and things like that. But yeah, 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 right. Any other questions? Absolutely, they're, they're better off because in many developing countries they don't have transmission systems yet. So if you don't have to pay, you know, let's say a kilowatt hour costs 10 cents, you know, 5 cents of that is the transmission lines you're paying for and the distribution and all that. If you can just go directly to solar, the cost effectiveness equation changes completely. You know, if they don't have to build a gas pipeline to every house. Um, and so I work actually with a, a nonprofit organization called Green Empowerment that works on getting solar and solar for water pumping, especially into more rural areas of developing countries because they've never had pumped water. They've never had water right there in the community. And right, right. So, you know, it's, um, and they don't have a whole system in many areas of having reliable electricity use. So having solar for the first time they don't mind having a compact fluorescent because they didn't have light bulbs everywhere. You know, and that's not quite true because most of the developing countries actually have huge urban areas that are very modern. And so it's sort of this, you know, I think we kind of think somehow here we make up this thing in our heads that it's this developing country is somehow rural, but they're not at all. Um, and really the developing areas of the U.S. have these huge, same huge issues in some ways. So thanks. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.